Welcome back to more Warhammer lore with Jumbo Thick. Today we will be covering the Elven Gods um, and their pantheon, including all of the more important aspects of the specific deities and a basic background for each um, god in question. The Elven Pantheon was actually created by the Elves long ago before the coming of Chaos. The Elves being highly intellectual and magical creatures understood how the realms that would be called Chaos functioned and so through a practice belief were able to create their own deities and have them physically manifest in the mortal world to perform great feats from forging mighty weapons to slaying their enemies. However, with the cataclysm where chaos washed over the world and a never-ending tide, something happened to the elves. They lost the ability to control their deities and instead began to actually believe them as gods as any other mortal race. The elven pantheon is very reminiscent of the Greek pantheon of our current world with the gods fighting amongst one another, coveting each other, and using their mortal followers almost as chess pieces in some elaborate game. The deities of the elves are divided into the Kadai, the gods of the heavens, and the Sithrai, the gods of the underworld. The dark elves give higher prominence to the Sithrai, particularly Cain, and the high elves give a higher prominence to the Kadai. The wood elves worship both equally, with the highest attention given to Kurnos and Isha of the Kadai, but Eldrazer and Anathrema of the Sithrai also have a high position in their society. The Kadai tend to represent productive and fundamental aspects of elven society, such as crafting and smithing, motherhood, farming, hunting, and are openly worshipped and revered by the High Elves and by the Wood Elves, with large temples and shrines, as well as like clergy and devotees who publicly profess their faith. Um, the High Elves in particular seem to revere Azurian, the creator of most of the Elves, almost like the Zeus of their pantheon, while the Wood Elves assign equally high rever reverence to Kurnos, the hunter, and Isha, the mother, as we spoke of earlier. But the Dark Elves seem to mostly completely ignore the Kadai in favor of the more underworld gods, the Sithrai gods, primarily Cain, but there are many others that they also worship. We will start with the head of the Kadai, Asurian. Asurian the Creator is the greatest and oldest of the Elf Gods. He is Lord of the Kadai, the Gods of the Heavens. According to the High Elves, he has been shaping their destiny according to his plan since the dawn of time. When a fight breaks out or there's a disagreement between the gods in heaven, his is the final say, and the other gods submit to his judgment. From his diamond throne, Azurian observes the world, draped in a cloak of lustrous white feathers, bearing a scepter and wearing a mask which is half white and half black. Azurian can take the form of a phoenix or a great eagle when he chooses and he is sometimes known as the Phoenix King, despite the ruler of Ulthuan sharing the same name. Assyrian's principal shrine rests upon the Isles of Flame in the Sea of Dreams. The structure itself is an ancient pyramid in which the eternal flame of the Phoenix burns. There, the princes of Ulthuan meet to elect the next Phoenix King, who must pass through Assyrian's fire for judgment by the Elven God. The shrine is guarded by the Phoenix Guard, who are shown their future, including their death, and thus take a vow of silence never allowed to share the knowledge that they have attained. Each candidate to become Phoenix King, once chosen by its fellow princes, must pass through the flame of Assyrian. If he is worthy, the flame will not harm him, and the new Phoenix King then becomes an avatar of Assyrian in the mortal world. If unworthy, the flames will burn the interloper, such as what happened to Malekith, the Witch King, the now head of the Dark Elf faction. And now we move on to Isha, the mother. Isha is the elven goddess of harvest and of natural bounty, mother of the earth and bringer of fertility. It was she who taught the elves the skills of agriculture and how to care for the land in which they lived. With Isha's blessing, the province of Avalorn remains free of winter's touch. Her husband is Kurnos, the goddess of hunt, and they have a daughter in Lilith. She is a merciful god who sends aid to the most in need of it. The High Elves consider the Everqueen to be the symbol of Isha, while the Wood Elves believe that honor belongs to their queen, Ariel, another incarnate of the goddess. This is a source of contention between the two races. The symbol of Isha is the all-seeing eye, 
shedding a single tear for her mortal children, the elves. At the dawn of time, Asurian decided that while the elves would be prodigiously long-lived, they would still grow weary of this world and die, as all creatures do. Isha, who loved her children above all other creations, despaired and cried in anguish, her tears falling like rain into the mortal world below, providing the waters of life that transformed Ulthuan into such a rich and bountiful land. Thereafter, Isha has watched the mortal children keenly, ever alert to ways in which she might aid them. Whilst direct contact has long been f forbidden by Assyrian, Isha sometimes pleads with her daughter, Lilith, to send tidings through dreams and nightmares, so that the elves might not confront their perils of the world without some measure of warning and guidance. Only when the creator's attention is elsewhere does Isha dare intervene personally, spreading her magics across Ulthuan to shrivel the demons and evildoers that threaten her children. Next in the pantheon will be Kurnos, Isha's husband. Kurnos is the elven god of the hunt and lord of beasts. He is the spirit of untouched wilderness, although he is said to have the ability to take the form of any forest creature at will. He is normally portrayed as a figure over ten foot tall, with an elven body but the head and tail of a stag. Kurnos is the husband of Isha, and he is the ultimate hunter. All elves are considered his children. His horn announces the wild hunt and calls his pack of hunting dogs to his side as he passes silently among the trees. The elves of Avalorn and the citizens of Illyrian worship Kurnos as their primary god. By never killing more than they must, hunters prove their loyalty to Kurnos. His affinity with the forest and wooded places holds a special significance with the wood elves, and his living avatar is Orion, the king of Avalorn. Kurnos' holy places are deep in the forest special clearings which are recognizable only to those who worship him. Kurnos is also said to have a connection to Tal, the god of nature of the race of men, because they are both represented by a long antlered stag's head. Aelith Anar of the High Elves has a special affiliation with Kurnos, uh, in that after spending many months amongst the forest he was gifted with the Bow of Kurnos, a powerful elven artifact that never misses its mark. Next for the Kadai is Hoith. Hoith is the lord of wisdom and knowledge. He is the elven god of learning and sorcery. Although one of the elven pantheon and held in esteem by all high elves, Hoith does not have much of a priesthood nor an organized system of churches in Ulthuan, save for the White Tower of Hoith. Yet all of the scholars, teachers, mages, all who seek truth and understanding are his servants in the world. The center of Hoith's worship is the White Tower raised at the order of the scholar king Belkahadris, where mages go to learn the art of high magic. The White Tower is guarded by the sword masters of Hoith, an ancient order of warrior monks who stand guardian over the tower and the scholars who dwell within. These devotees of the sword devote themselves to the worship of Hoith in no lesser manner than those who study high magic, learning to control their bodies and their minds through meditation and exercise. In traditional religious iconography, Hoith is depicted as an elderly elf clad in the robes of a lore master. And as the Lord of Wisdom, Hoith is the embodiment of erudition and patron of all those who search for a greater understanding. The elves believe it was he who gifted the race with much of the knowledge they now take for granted. Their opinion is divided on precisely why Hoith did grant them this knowledge. Most elves believe Hoith's actions were founded in generosity. But some utter darkly of how his gift of knowledge has led to progress, and progress inevitably leads to the ruin of tradition. Uh, whatever the motivations, legend tells that when Assyrian learned of Hoith gifting the elves with knowledge, he re rebuked the Lord of Wisdom, and in punishment set most of his great library ablaze. The next god of the Kadai is Vol, the Maker. Vol is the armorer to the host of heaven, and patron to blacksmiths and artisans. He is both crippled and blind, wounded in an ancient war of the gods when he challenged Cain. Enslaved to Cain's will, Vol is forced to make weapons of extraordinary power for the war god's eternal battle against his great enemies. Vol has thus labored for time untold, but his hatred for Cain has never slackened. Even so, the maker nurtures no seed of rebellion, but bears his shame in silence. He knows that the elves will need Cain's fire and fury if they are to survive the great darkness that is coming. So does Vol's desire for revenge go unfulfilled. 
There's one more burden for his twisted body to bear. Before we go any further, I'd like to note that the reason Vol is such a broken shadow of his former self is because of the wounds he received at the hands of Cain. Cain essentially coveted Isha and took her from Kernos. And so the god of the hunt and Vol both fought him together to reclaim her, but they were no match for the Lord of Murder, and both were beaten. It was then that Vol was struck a bargain with Cain to free Isha by paying a ransom in blades. To this Cain agreed and Vol has ever been subservient to him since. Now as Vol works his tears hiss upon the forge, falling to the mortal world as shards of flint. Mightiest of the blades forged at Vol's hand was the Widowmaker, and it was Drognir, father of the dragons, who provided the fire that tempted that steel. Alas the weapon thirsted, even then, and stole from Drognir more than he sought to give. Thereafter, the fate of Drognir's line, the dragons, was eternally bound to that of the elves. Now, Vol is the patron to elven artisans, crafters, smiths, armorers, and the like, and among the Azrai, the wood elves, the skilled archers of the Glaive Guard always fashion their own arrows, not trusting such a vital task to any other. A hunter is nothing without his quiver of reliable arrows, and as a result, they hold the maker in an especially high esteem. Each glade guard carries one flint-headed arrow inscribed with the words Ethris ye iridon in Fan Etherian, meaning the maker's tear, in reference to Val. And in addition to Val, Lord Daith, who is the ruler of Tor Gavan within the forest of Athaloran, has a kind of eerie connection with the uh, smith god. There are strong hints that he may in fact be Val in mortal form. He is the greatest living elven smith and has been blind for as long as any elf can remember, hint hint. And some also say that he may have even forged the dragon armor of Anarion, the first phoenix king. And it is known that he did forge the mighty sword of Daith, wielded by the eldest of ancients, Durthu, the tree man, in defense of Althaloran. Now we move on to Loic, the Shadow Dancer. Loic, the Dancer of the Shadows, is the elven god of laughter, tricks, and dance in the Warhammer world, who does many of the same things as Liadriel, um, a goddess we will be touching on later. Um, elven legends tell that he often frees the elves' souls from the hands of the gods of chaos using funny tricks. However, Loic also has a dark side. He is a god of shadows, night, vengeance, malicious tricks and dark magic though he fights for elven souls it is hard to say about him that he is either good or even a neutral god at that loic is often depicted as a lightly built elf his face hidden in perpetual shade he dances among the shadows ready to leap out and play one of his tricks upon both mortal and god whether for good or evil Loic's followers are often identified by the rune of Arhain wound around their necks or engraved upon the hilts of their knives. While the worshippers of Loic have no true temples, they may have personal shrines within their homes. Due to his very nature, he is most often associated with wandering shadow warriors of Nagarathi, not to be confused with the Dark Elves. These warriors are followers of Aelith and Ar, the Shadow King, and are High Elves that patrol the land of Nagarathi the former Dark Elf homeland. They call upon Loic for his aid in traversing their lands and waylaying their foes. He is also paid tribute during any times of festival, being a god of dance. Loic is also associated with dragons. Though forced dragons seldom pay heed or homage to any deities of the elves, most have a grudging respect for Loic, the Lord of Laughter. At heart, dragons are creatures of cunning and intellect, and they admire the ways by which the Shadow Dancer rescues elven souls from Slanesh, as well as the trickery Loek employs to erode the Dark Prince's vengeance once the deed is done. Indeed, many forest dragons hold true to the belief that Loek honed his cleverness under the tutelage of Drognir, the father of dragons. The war dancers, being Loic's foremost devotees, hold that the opposite is true, and love to engage forest dragons in battles of wit to prove their point. Now, before we move on to the last of the Kadai gods, it's important to note that with the coming of chaos, the elves lost their connection to heaven, essentially. 
So when an elf dies, his soul is subject to a gruesome end, as all elf souls are now claimed by Slanesh, the Dark Prince. Because these souls are the embodiments of the emotions he feeds off of, he sees them as a delicacy and hoards them all to himself, essentially. Um, so when an elf dies, he must either rely on Loic to save his soul, as you heard, which does not happen very often, or Ethrakail, the Pale Queen, to enslave their souls in an army of the damned. Not a very good fate. Or what they've developed now is they usually will bind their being into a waystone upon their death, um, which are used to protect the elven lands from corruption and um, various attacks. And so their souls actually power the waystones. And with that, we move on to Lilith the Maiden. Lilith the Maiden is the goddess of dreams and fortune, worshipped as part of a kind of triangle along with Isha, who is her mother, and Moira Haig. She is the patron of seers and prophets, and is prayed to for clarity, prophecy, and foresight, especially by an elf facing a great challenge or difficult decision, or need of some good luck. The goddess is also known to ride a celestial steed named Cindermane, who bears her across the heavens. Lilith was reputed to have given three gifts to the elves, known as the blessings of Lilith. These were the star crown, said to give the wearer visions of, of all times and places known to the gods, the amulet of sunfire, which burned so bright and pure no evil creature could stand in its presence, and the staff of Lilith, which grants its wielder terrifying arcane might. The star crown was shattered many thousands of years ago during the sundering, and the amulet of sunfire was lost when the wearer fell into the sea after a ship was caught in a great storm. But the moon staff of Lilith is currently in the possession of High Master Teclis of the White Tower of Hoeth. Lilith actually has a deep connection with the next uh, and last Kadai god I will be speaking of, uh, Ladriel. Ladriel, the Lady of Mists, is the protector of all things that are hidden or lost, and patrons of travelers in the wilderness. By tradition, she is the only goddess to any longer walk the mortal world, and there are tales of her coming to the aid of those lost amidst the mist of Yves, or upon the trackless ocean. Her worship is therefore chiefly observed in those cities, such as Lothran and Tordivesh, where elven wanderlust has never faded. Ladriel's face is always hidden by a veil, but many elves assume she is the most beautiful of the goddesses. Others, however, suspect she is merely a guise adopted by another deity, one whose true aspect is concealed behind the ashen silk. It is revealed in the end times that Ladriel is actually Lilith in disguise, and she has been masquerading as a human deity for many years. During the time of Gilles Le Breton, Ladriel, or Lilith if you prefer, would be known as the Lady of the Lake by the humans, and chose Bretonia as her own mortal realm. She slowly began to favor the Bretonians even more than the elves, bestowing upon their greatest warriors a part of her own power. These warriors would later be known as Grail Knights. She has also begun taking mortal women to be her priestesses, powerful mages known, known as damsels and prophetesses. And with that, we are done with all the important members of the Kadai gods. And now we will move into the Sithrai, or elven gods of the underworld. And we will start with Aerith Kail, also known as the Pale Queen. Aerith Kail is the supreme goddess of the underworld, with her son Nethu, its guardian. Long ago, she attempted to seduce Sasurian, and when he resisted her, she grew enraged stole the souls of the dead and hid them in the black pit Mirai. The Pale Queen has never forgotten Azurian's slight. While he lies beyond her power, the elves do not. So it is they who suffer Erethkael's wrath. Should a waystone be destroyed, Erethkael sends the wraith-like Rephilim to seize the souls that they bear and take them back to Mirai in eternal torment. Such thievery must be quick for Slanesh, the Dark Prince of Chaos, suffers no one, not even the Pale Queen, to take even the meanest of scraps from his table. Erethkael's deeds may have made her an outcast from Azurian's court, but many of the elves' darker deities acknowledge her as their mistress. Even so, she is seldom worshipped in Ulthuan, 
Most folk do not entreat Ethrakael's blessings, but hope to avoid her attention altogether, wearing sprigs of wordroot or black hame to avert her vengeful gaze. Some elves, however, think it better for their spirits to endure eternity in torment rather than meet oblivion through Slaanesh's hunger, and thus secretly court the Pale Queen's fickle favor. In Nagaroth, Ethrakael is a much courted deity, for the Dark Elves see their own betrayal echoed in her fate. The Pale Queen alone offers the Druchi some salvation from Slaanesh's hunger, for her own armies are forged from the stolen souls of the elf dead. That is not to say that all elves who have ever died now lab labor in Ethra Kael's service, since countless souls remain bound to waystones and trees, and many more were devoured by the Dark Prince. Yet still, year after year, the Pale Queen's army has been growing, and one day her shadowy legion will tear down Azurian's vaunted creations in payment for his insults of old. There's a rumor in Nagaroth, however, that there is one soul Ethrakael yearns to seize beyond all others, in Malakith. The Pale Queen sees a consort whose ruthlessness is fit to match her own, and she has sworn that it is he who will one day lead her final vengeful assault on creation. The next Sithrai god is Nethu. Nethu is the son of Erethkael. He is the gatekeeper of Mirai, the elven underworld. It is his task to see that those souls claimed by the Pale Queen remain sealed away until the hour of Rana Duranda, the last battles of the gods, or the apocalypse. It is also Nethu's duty to see that no intruder breaches the Mirai to steal away the secrets of the dead, at least not without offering a suitable tribute to the Pale Queen. In this, the Keeper of the Last Door is aided by a host of dark pegasi, who watch unblinkingly from the battlements of his dark fortress, easily mistaken for a statuary by the unwary. When roused, none are safe, for the shadowy moss consumes souls just as easily as mortal flesh. As a doorkeeper, he keeps a ring of silver keys on his waist, and it is said making the sigil of Nethu on a piece of property belonging to an elf will gradually sap away at their soul until they waste away, and the Dark Elf thinks this is actually just hilarious to sneak into the bedrooms of High Elf officials and put the sigil under their beds, so Nethu will nab them away. They did this to a particular High Elf lore master of the White Tower once, and despite weeks of searching for him, no one was able to find the person responsible. The next god of the Sithrai is arguably the most famous. It is Cain. Caleb and Shikain, the bloody-handed god, or simply Cain, is the elven god of violence, cruelty, blood, and murder. Having long abandoned all the other elven gods, the Dark Elves are a society built around the celebration of his murderous nature. But Cain is not exclusive to these bloodthirsty elves. No, he has a presence even amongst humanity. Imperials associate Cain with more, citing myths that link the two as brothers, each battling for control over the province of death. The Lord of Murder is upheld by killers, thieves, and even some soldiers. The Dark Elves believe the distinction between Corn and Cain is one of degrees. Where Cain is the controlled violence of ritual and religious practice, Corn is the uncontrolled savagery of the rabid dog, the wild killing sprees undertaken by the Norsemen and the other madmen of the Chaos Waste. And just as the Empire takes steps to eliminate followers of Corn, so too do the Dark Elves snuff out the lives of those who embrace the blood god of Chaos. Cain's principal servants are the Witch Elves, called the Brides of Cain. As maiden elves, his servants are wedded to him in midnight rites of blood sacrifice and cruel abasement. When the temple fires grow hot and the night black and cold, Cain takes his new brides and blood flows in torrents down the steps of his altar. Cain is not the only lord of murder, but also a god of war, and so is the custom to invoke him in battle, where he is seen to bless the strong whom give him tribute through blood. It matters not if the blood is that of, of your enemies or your kin, only that is given and you yearn to reap a heavy toll in his name. Cain is the chief deity of the Dark Elf um, pantheon and therefore ha holds a very high place in their society and they even have an entire temple order dedicated to him in the Temple of Cain. Now moving on to Anathrema, 
Not to be confused with Kurnos, Anathrema is the sister of Cain and goddess of the savage hunt, not the wild hunt. Through her, the Dark Elves are gifted the joy of chase and of the kill. Anathrema does not care who or what is hunted. Every living creature is prey to the bloodthirsty goddess. The Savage Huntress is a vengeful deity, who about her waist wears a belt of heads and hands. Tokens claimed from hunters who bore her blessings but offered no praise in return. Legend also tells that her amorous advances were once spurned by Kurnos, and so she is also worshipped by some elves as a patron of jealous lovers, an avenging deity who will hunt down and slay those who have wronged her supplicants. To the Wood Elves, Anathrema is the dark mirror to Kurnos. Where the disciples of Kurnos venerate wild places, those who follow with Anarema see them only as bounteous lands where the dominant predator can stake their fury and blood of, of the weak. Such selfish behavior is seldom tolerated even in Athelorn, for it is certain that it will upset the balance of the weave, but it is rumored that many embittered warriors of the Pine Crags clan have forsaken Kurnos in favor of a more vindictive mistress. It is said in legend of the elves that when Drognir, the father of the dragons, was welcomed to Assyrian's court, Anathrema saw him as a mere beast to be harried, and so she hunted him with her spear. A great battle erupted through the heavens. The combat shook the world to its core, until finally Assyrian halted the battle, but it was too late to save Drognir. And with a single word, he banished her to Mirai forever. Now next for the Sithrai is Atharti. Atharti is the elven goddess of pleasure and seduction, often depicted as a masked figure intertwined with blood-red snakes. She has a profaned rivalry with her sister Hecarti, and each has made many attempts to slay the other. The Lady of Desire is a mistress of all forms of seduction, and the very sight of her is said to cause mortals to collapse in complete and unquestioning abasement. For this reason, the Nagarathi, who infiltrate High Elf society, count Atharti amongst their foremost patrons, for only she can unlock the hearts and minds of those they wish to corrupt. And also moving on to her sister, Hecarti. Hecarti is the elven goddess of conjurations and dark magic. She has no shrines, save for a small temple within Grand, and a dark covenant that corresponds with it. She sees all the winds of magic and has six arms to carry her sacred accountments. A scepter-headed staff, a beating heart, a scorpion, a broken bow, a serrated dagger, and a phial of orphan's tears. Unlike many of her kind, Hakarti pays close attention to the desires of the elves. She is ever locked in jealous contest with her twin sister, Atharti, the go goddess of pleasure, and resents her sway over the mortals. It was supposedly this rivalry that first enticed Hecarti to grant wisdom to Marathi, the mother of Malekith. That said, the hag sorceress has always kept her devotions to the two sisters in careful balance, because in Nagarathi many legends have come about that show the grim examples of what happens to those who favor one sister over the other. And now we come to Eldrazer, the Lord of Blades. Eldrazer, the Lord of Blades, is the elven god of battle. Obsessed with the skillful arts of war, he is seldom ranks high amongst his pantheon. For many dark elves, save the legendary sisters of slaughter, scorn his reluctance to fight, save in the pursuit of honor. However, once Eldrazer decides to fight, he does so without mercy. Any tactic is permissible within his arena of death, and he constantly redefines the arena's bounds in the mortal realm. It is impossible to know if you are within it until it is too late. Eldrazer is the patron of duelists and of those who yearn to fight battles for the sake of honor. As such, his favor is often sought by warriors of the Eternal Guard of the Wood Elves, especially on the eve of a trial by combat. Yet Eldrazer's favor is also valuable in an actual battle, at least if the combatant fights for a just cause rather than out of mindless barbarism. So it is that one of the oldest traditions of the Eternal Guard is to ritually consecrate regions of Athalorn and mark them with cross dagger pendants and finger bones. Thus are many of the forest glades sanctified as mortal extensions of Eldrazer's otherworldly arena of death. 
It is said that the Lord of Blades pays special attention to those battles fought upon his holy ground, and will even intervene if he is moved to do so. As a result, the Eternal Guard habitually plan any defense of Athalorn around these key sites. Mortal valor and skill is all very well, but only a fool passes up the opportunity to have a god join him in battle. The next Sithrai god is a kind of special one, um, Elenil. Elenil is the elven god of disaster and the lord of destruction. Together with his children, they form the Elenili. Legends tell that Elenil once had more than 100 offspring, each of whom had inherited an aspect of his destructive nature. Together, father and progeny inflicted all manner of disasters upon the world, reveling in the harm they unleashed upon the elves. Elenil was proud of his children, but he was also paranoid and worried that they might conspire to supplant him one day. Individually, his offspring were no match for him, but the Lord of Destruction was wary of their combined strength and so watched over them closely. Finally, Isha could bear the suffering of the elves no more and pleaded with the other gods to curtail the actions of Elenil. All save one refused to heed her, for they were all wary of provoking Elenil's wrath. Only Loic, the trickster, answered Isha's plea, and he soon deceived Elenil into believing that the long-feared betrayal had finally arrived. Upon hearing Loic's words, the Lord of Destruction flew into a rage, and one by one hunted down and consumed his children reclaiming the facets of destruction they had once embodied. Yet the battles had weakened Elenil, and he would never again know the level of godly might he once enjoyed. Of all of Elenil's, only five children survived. Adioth, bringer of wrath and fire, Estruth, herald of famine and drought, Hukon, the Sunderer, Mathlan, king of storm and sea, and Drakira, queen of vengeance. They all have hid themselves in the mortal world and have never returned to the heavens in hopes of not joining their siblings' fate. And now we will move into Adioth, um, one of Elenil's children. Adioth is the god of the all-consuming flame. He can be ranked as the least subtle of all the elven gods and prefers direct and forceful solutions to any obstacle placed in his path. The, the Breener of Wrath and Fire is a being of monstrous pride and unbridled power. When Elenil set about devouring his offspring, most fled or attempted to hide. Adioth did neither, but met his, his Eben Sire in battle. For three days and three nights, son matched father blow for blow in a conflict that shook the heavens and drowned the mortal world in flame. Adioth knew that he was overmatched, but his hubris made concession unthinkable and his anger lent him the strength to fight on. Nonetheless, it was a battle that Adioth could not win. He was sure to have been vanquished had not Ladriel, Lady of Mists, blinded Elenil and spirited Adioth away to the mortal world. As the millennia passed, Adioth healed from his grievous wounds he suffered from that day, but he has never forgiven Ladriel for interfering. He knew that the other gods believed him to have fled the field, and the shame of it hangs heavy on him. Even so, the bringer of wrath and fire knows he is destined to fight his father once again, and spares no effort in preparing for that inevitable battle. He labors beneath the mountains, crafting new weapons to aid his victory. Alas, Adioth is a very poor smith, and too proud to ask Vol for aid. Thus every blade he creates is flawed beyond redemption. With each failure, his anger grows, causing the ground to quake and lava to flow. In Nagaroth, the Dark Elves see fire burst from the mountaintops and know that the bringer of wrath and fire has forged another crooked sword. On to Drakira. Drakira, the Queen of Vengeance, is the elven goddess of retribution and daughter of Elinil, Lord of Destruction. No affection binds this family, for theirs was one only shared by the delight and suffering they could inflict upon the mortal elves. Indeed, Drakira was most often mocked by her brothers and sisters, for their power was to wreak destruction on a grand scale, or hers was a subtle gift, whose wicked fruits bloomed only with patient tending. When Isha wept for the woes of Elinil's children inflicted upon the elves, Drakira saw an opportunity. It was she who shaped Isha's tears of mourning into bitter shards, who stoked the mother goddess's grief until her desire for retribution burned bright. 
Thus did Drakira, frailest of all of Elinil's children, bring about the fall of her siblings. Those who survived the horror of Isha's grief were ever careful never to offend their sister again. All Dark Elves know this story and are careful to treat the Queen of Vengeance with the respect her family denied her. They believe that she looks favorably upon their vendetta with the High Elves for what goddess retribution could possibly deny a people so badly wronged. The truth is, of course, that Drakir supports the Elves of Ulthuan and Nagaroth in equal measure. The desire for vengeance burns bright on both sides of the ocean, and the Queen of Vengeance has no need to take sides. She lends her aid to an elf in whom the desire for retribution burns bright, regardless of rank or rightness of cause. There is always a price, of course, because no act of vengeance leaves the perpetrator entirely as they were, and a bargain with Drakira inevitably costs the supplicant more than they ever intended to give. Finally, to the last of Elinil's children, Mathlan. As the lord of the sea and gods of storm, Mathlan is patron to sailors and explorers, and is prayed to by elves about to embark on a voyage or seeking new lands. He is also prayed to by loved ones of those elves who are abroad, so he will bring them home safe and sound. Mathlan is one of the main gods worshipped by the elves in Marienburg. He is also one of the few Sithrai that the high elves venerate nearly as much as the dark elves. Mithlan is a fickle god, distrusted by many of Ulthuan's folk. He is the king of storm and sea, ruler of all those who dwell below the waves, and has little love for any of the Dryland's creatures. Only the mariners of Kothk and Lothurn have any love for the lord of the deeps, and they embrace him as patriarch far more willingly than they do Kurnos or Surian. Such behavior is disapproved of in other corners of Ulthuan, where tradition portrays Mithlan as destructive deity. But such scorn has little impact on those elves whose lives and livelihoods rely on safe passage of the open seas. Blackheart Corsairs revere Mithlan most highly, in part this is simply good sense. Any elf who spends so much of his life upon the waves is well advised to ensure he remains in good standing with the king of storms and sea. However, the Corsairs also feel a kinship with Mithlan that restrains mere worship for they too are a force of destruction that strikes without warning for, from calm seas, bringing ruin to fleets, ports, and even coastlines. Now, little is known about Elinil's other remaining children, Hukan and Estruth, outside of their roles as the Sunderer and Famine God, and so I don't have any more to give uh, for them, unfortunately. The final deity of the Elven Pantheon I wish to cover is technically a Sithrai God, but she doesn't quite fall under that category, but neither is she a Kadai god either. She's very similar to Loic in that fashion. Uh, Moira Haig, also known as the Crow Goddess or the Crone, is the elven goddess of fate and death. Within her rune pouch, she holds the fate of all mortals. It is considered a dark practice to openly pay tribute to her. Neither Kadai nor Sithrai. The elves only pay enough tribute to her so that she will not harm them so that they may attempt to forestall their inevitable death. An ancient and withered creature, Mora Haig is the keeper of souls and the weaver of prophecy. She and she alone knows the future and reads the patterns of time. She set the stars of the heavens and thus the future can be read from the night sky. The High Elves believe Mora Haig knows the future of all and that every death, no matter how trivial, is foretold by the crone. Mora Haig is a vexum and shifting being, and commonly stands apart from the quarrels of the other gods. Hers is not the distance aloofness practiced by a Surian, however, but a scheming neutrality that exploits any heavenly discord to her own advantage. Thus, there is not a god of the elves who does not owe Mora Haig thanks and retribution in equal measure. Ravens are said to be Mora Haig's messengers. They soar across Ulthuan and the barbaric lands of the younger races, bearing snippets of the crone's god's wisdom to those who have the wit to interpret the signs. Thus, Ulthuan's archer regiments hark at every raven song, and mourn the passing of each member of the chorus. Such actions are thought to be the obsessions of simple minds by some of the nobility, but the archers don't care. It does not do to mock Mora Haig, they say. She knows whether the arrows they loose will find their mark or not and such knowledge grants a power that should not be offended. Now, before the sundering of the elf, um, the followers of Mora Haig were known as the Raven Heralds, 
and exhibited untold foresight and knowledge, often appearing out of thin air to deliver a message on behalf of their goddess, and just as quickly disappearing. It is one such herald that saved Aelith Dinar the Shadow King many times, through his convoluted warnings and prophecies. And with that, we close out our lore video on the Elven Pantheon. We have covered all of the Elven Gods, well, the Portan ones at least. And as you can see, there are lots of spells and units associated with the various deities that are very reminiscent to the Greek Pantheon, the deities that is, um, with Assyrian being almost like Zeus, Fall Hephaestus, Cain is Ares, and so on. And hopefully you learn something about the elves in general, be, albeit they, the high elves, the dark elves, the wood elves, they all worship these deities in their own unique way. And it says something about their culture and that all these deities have different, different representation depending on who is doing the worshiping at the time. And with that, I am done. I have been Jumbo Thick. Thanks for watching if you've made it this far. Make sure to like and subscribe for future content, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Have a good day.